Mason, welcome. Thank you. Great hey, to be here. Really good to have you here, man. We've been trying to do this for a while on the back of your colleague, um, Daron Sher, who everyone's loved and it's been listened to many, many times. I want to start just a little bit of background about you, where you did your study, metabolic medicine in general, and you know just what's happening in the field. Well, I guess the key defining thing for me is I'm a sports and exercise medicine physician. So I spend my days with athletes and uh, as you know, for athletes, body weight and performance is a key consideration. And as it so turned out, that's uh, gradually evolved into dealing with more and more members of the general public. Mm. And uh, for me personally, I used to have metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is a, a condition if, you're, if you tick three boxes out of five, that includes central adiposity, low HDL, high triglycerides, high blood sugar levels, high blood pressure, then you have metabolic syndrome. Mm. And I was in my 30s and I had metabolic syndrome. And as you know, most doctors are a bit OCD, a bit yeah. type A. So I followed to a T the advice that I was told. I counted the milligrams of sodium that I was having on a daily basis. I made sure I had a low fat diet. I did not care about the carbohydrates nor the sugar mm. because we were told that was okay. So food pyramid. I had massive amounts of carbs and sugar. Yeah. I was exercising every day. I would ride my bike to and from, you know, wherever if I was working or studying, you know, I'd be exercising for at least an hour, hour and a half every day. Mm. And still I developed metabolic syndrome. And uh, so I guess there was a bit of a personal journey in there and yeah. then it, it morphed into a professional a interest. You. Yep. So you did your undergrad study at Sydney University? Yeah, well, I've got, a, I've, I've got three degrees. So I started out doing physiotherapy down in Melbourne. Yeah. Uh, then I did my medical degree at University of Sydney. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I did that, then I followed that up with a, a master's degree in occupational health. Interesting. And uh, then I've sort of... Uh, morphed off into just doing, I guess, private study or personal study mm. uh, on uh, ketogenic diets, low-carb diets, nutrition, health in general. Metabolic medicine, it seems to be a bit of a new area of specialty. What actually is it? Obviously, it's it's, it's dealing with people's metabolic health, but for those that, that don't understand that, like how do you diagnose whether you've got metabolic syndrome? How do you diagnose whether you've got a healthy metabolic system? Give us a little bit of insight to, to the field of medicine. Well, I think in a nutshell, um, metabolic syndrome comes down to insulin, which is a hormone in mm. the body. And as I mentioned earlier, there's five diagnostic features in what we term metabolic syndrome. And each one of those five is caused by something called insulin resistance which is basically high levels of insulin. And that's been proven in multitudes of papers. Um, biochemically, it's been mapped out. We know how it happens, we know why it happens, and we've proven that it does happen. So metabolic ill health is a consequence of insulin resistance. And then if you want to take it one step further, what's the biggest cause in the population for insulin resistance? It's dietary carbohydrate. Mm. And yet that's what we were taught to, to eat for a long, long time. That's what I was taught to eat. So I, I, I studied physiotherapy in the 90s. Mm. And uh, so what did I do when I got out? Well, we were taught the food pyramid. Mm. So, uh, you know, I used to advocate that. And uh, when I went to back to med school, what did we get taught? Carbs are good. Carbs yeah. are good. And yet, if when, any, I, my understanding of how much nutrition study is done in a medical degree is is deplorably low. Yes, yes. So I believe we had one hour of nutrition. I, I couldn't actually recall what was in that one hour lecture. Mm. Um, but given that in my practice, I have a quite a holistic practice, and I see a lot of people for a lot of different conditions. And I'd say attention to nutrition probably forms 50, 60, possibly more of my practice. Mm. So the formal teaching I've had is totally disproportionate with how important it is. One of these amazing new age doctors that instead of writing a prescription, actually write you some, some dietary framework, perhaps. Well, exactly. So we prescribe dietary advice. And I probably just to reflect on your comment on writing a prescription, 
in medical school, we're taught how to write prescriptions. Mm. We're taught, uh, you know, here's what drug you use for what condition. This is the starting dose. If that's not effective, you increase it to this. Um, we know this very well. What we're not taught and what was the one of the biggest conceptual challenges for me when I first started practicing medicine like this is deprescribing, taking people off medications. Mm. So if we take somebody, as I said, high blood pressure is one of the features of metabolic syndrome, a patient might come in and they might have normal blood pressure, but they might be on three different medications designed to lower the blood pressure. So then what happens if we start correcting their, the underlying cause of their high blood pressure mm. and they're still on these three agents? Well, we know what happens. They'll, they'll probably faint. They'll feel dizzy. They'll feel lousy because mm. they're, it, it's... It's like you took a normal person with normal blood pressure and just put them on a bunch of medications to drop their blood pressure. So then the art is then, well, how do you know which medication to reduce first and how much, you know, if you reduce it too quickly, is that going to cause a problem? It's exactly the same in a diabetic who needs to inject insulin. If I put somebody who's on a, a standard Australian diet, the SAD diet. The SAD diet, I love that. And... Uh, and I put them overnight on a strict low-carb diet, then I actually need to reduce their insulin dose in the vicinity of 50%. Otherwise, they'll have a what we call a hypoglycemic event where because of the injected insulin, their blood sugar will go too low. Mm. And that, that could put them in a coma that could even kill them. So this whole element of deprescribing is actually uh, it wasn't touched on at all in medical school. Of course it wasn't. It's the uh, is surgery and, and pharmaceuticals are at the heart of the commercial model of medicine. Yeah, look, I'm I agree with you. Maybe I, I you're probably, disproving I probably, that. But I probably will I probably will defend the medical profession to a degree that I love the medical I profession. Don't, I told you that. My mum, my dad, my brother are all doctors, so yeah. I have nothing but respect for medicine. But I, the, the the institution itself mm. seems to be flawed. I, oh, the institution is flawed, but I would like to make a distinction that I think a lot of the, the harm that the medical profession is doing, I think it's more through negligence and not through culpability. Doctors yeah. don't set out to harm their patients. Negligence or ignorance? Well, I think if, you're, if you don't educate yourself about yeah, the latest sign, I would argue that's negligence. Yeah. But I don't think they do it deliberately. Mm. I, I think there's a, there's a duty of care that we have to stay up to date and informed of the science and if we don't do that for whatever reason i think we're failing our obligation to our patients yeah no it's a really good point i want to talk about the two ends of the the proverbial spectrum that is getting more more airplay becoming more divisive than than any other thing perhaps other than climate change which kind of ties into it anyway it's but that's the vegans on one end and the carnivores on the other and have a really objective look at the benefits of like let's talk about red meat because it's probably the most nutritionally dense of of all the meats on one end of what actually is in it and what is potentially dangerous about it and then on the other end the the nutrients that you get being on a on a vegan diet and the benefits of that and the potential dangers of that yeah. and i know that's a that's a, it's it's a big ask but can we just start with that like let, let let's start with the plants like what's the benefit of being on a vegan diet Look, I think the benefit of going to a vegan diet is that you are no longer on the standard Australian diet. You're not on a sad diet. Being heavily processed, sugar. Lots of sugars. Now, yeah. the problem with... But you can have a lot of sugars on a vegan diet. There's a lot of vegans I know that have a lot of sugars and And they're very unhealthy. Yeah. But the problem is when we do the research, the research doesn't include those sugars. It doesn't include the Tim Tams and the snakes and all these kind of things mm. on the research. So... You can pick any diet you want. If you compare it to the very low bar that is a standard Australian oh, diet, yeah. it is going to come out superior. Yeah, of course. So when people point at the studies and say, this diet found this and this study showed this and it's clearly good, it's like, well, what are you comparing it to? Mm. And nobody has compared a whole foods animal-based diet with a whole foods vegetarian or yeah. vegan diet, or yeah. plant-based. So when they're, uh, one of the big problems with the research is that when they're looking at what they consider to be red meat, they're actually conflating it with 
intake of junk food. So a lot of it is and done. And all sorts of other confounding factors, yeah? Well, absolutely. But let, let's just address this one for the moment. So a lot of the studies are done on food frequency questionnaires, which so if I can do, how many milligrams of salt did you have yesterday? Yeah. How many eggs have you had in the last 12 months? Uh, you know, these things are just Most inherent- people can't remember what they had for breakfast. Let exactly. Alone. Yeah, I get it. Inherently unreliable. Yeah. And then, Just for, for people's knowledge, is, is this a typical epidemiological study that they use the framework for? Yes. Yeah. Food, food frequency questionnaires are a standard instrument involved yeah. in nutritional research. And then we might take something like intake. And if somebody's eaten pizza, do you know what food group pizza gets in class does? Red meat. Yeah, wow. Because it might have a bit of meat on it. Yeah. Now, if you're having a pizza, could you be having a soft drink perhaps at the same time? Mm. If you're having a hot dog, you know, are you sort of having, you, you're not having that uh, with a salad on the side, are you? Mm. Um, so there's these confounding variables where the, the misclassification of foods, the, the poor recall of foods, and the, uh, the associated health behaviours, which you alluded to before. Now, we have a, it's it's a healthy user bias is what we call it. So if you believe that something is healthy um, or unhealthy, then that's going to influence your behaviour. If you're the kind of person who takes care of your health and somebody says red meat is bad for you, you say, fine, I'll eat less red meat. Mm. You're also the kind of person who will probably quit smoking if yeah. you're addicted to smoking. You'll exercise because you're told that that's good. You'll try and get enough sleep because you're being told that's useful. Mm. So because of this association that red meat, it's been correlated um, at least in the public perception with ill health, uh, a lot of the research is now subject to this healthy user bias. Mm. And this is why the epidemiological research, or as some people term it, the epidemiological research, yeah. it, you just can't trust it. And until... They come out with a proper experimental design that compares a whole foods animal diet. That means without the soft drinks. Yeah. That means, you know, it's not red meat on pizza. It's yeah. red meat from well-cooked, healthy steak yeah. compared to a whole foods plant-based diet. We're not going to have a definitive answer. Yeah. But if we have a look at uh, things from a, a biochemical perspective or a nutrient density perspective or any other number of uh, ways we can clearly see there's benefits in animal foods. There was a paper uh, published a few years ago, um, and I believe it was sanctioned by the World Health Organization looking at stunting in different countries across the world. Stunting, like stunting, not yeah. growing at all. Retarded growth in yeah. children, um, pathological. Yeah. And that actually showed a clear correlation with lack of animal food intake. Mm. Um, they, they did... Uh, interventional studies. There was one study they did in Ecuador where they actually, uh, a control group, they gave them an egg a day Um, because it's a lot of the reason that animal protein is not consumed across most of the world is nothing to do with attitudes to meat. It's due to its economics and availability. I mean, we're incredibly in the fortunate position where we have the option of having animal products if we don't. Unfortunately, in much of the world, that's not the case. Mm. And they're actually f- able to find that they are able to prevent a lot of this pathological stunting in children just with an egg a day. Now, and they've also done various analyses looking at other animal foods. And basically, they found that, you know, red meat, dairy and eggs are absolute winners when it comes to child's health and growth and development. Mm. Now, if we were to just stay on this for a moment, um, the developing brain uh, requires an omega-3 fat called DHA. So I think something like uh, two-thirds of the brain is uh, fat, and of that, this DHA fat, it's an omega-3 fat, is a major, major part of it. And this does not come from animal foods. Uh, perhaps with the potential exception of algae, mm-hmm. which is why it's in fish. Yeah. But we're not eating algae. Um, the animal foods we're eating, the flax seeds, that's got a, a form of omega-3 that's very poorly bioavailable and very little, if any, will actually be converted into this uh, DHA, which is a building block mm. for the brain. So uh, there's been uh, lots of research looking at developing children and cognition and brain and 
it's a pretty clear picture that if you have this available in the diet, uh, it actually will affect the IQ. How can I play devil's advocate? Because the study thing is is really interesting to me in that you can virtually find research to support whatever argument you want. How do you, like we talked before about some of these epidemiological studies and that there are mm. confounding factors that aren't taken into account. So are you comparing apples with apples and so on and so forth? The studies that you refer to with brain development in children and things, how do people know what studies they can rely on and that it's not just someone that believes in a in a certain science is finding the, um, the studies that support their view, whereas there's probably equal number of studies on the other side of the ledger. So when you're reading the study, yeah. if it says epidemiology mm -hmm. or correlation, be very suspicious. So correlation is what happens when we say, look, the, uh, you know, the, uh, you, you pick some random event. Um, let's say it's, uh, it, get, it gets light in here when you walk into the room, mm. you might have a sense of light and you say, well, that seems that whenever, so walking actually turns the light on. Mm. Well, perhaps it is, but it's actually more than that. It's actually, you know, this sensor and it activates and it's the electricity running through the wires that actually will lead to the, the light being there. Yeah. So just because something happens at the same time doesn't mean it's a direct cause of it. So for that matter, we actually want to look for experimental designs. So this study I described in Ecuador was where they actually had one group of children who didn't get an egg and they had another group of children who did get the egg. Mm. But they were in the same socioeconomic status, they were the same age, they were in the same country, so all the other variables mm. were taken care of. So because, I, as, as I said, if you're having a pizza, you're probably having a soft drink with it. So sure. these are what we call confounding variables. And by having two control groups that are randomly allocated, those, in theory, if we have enough numbers in the groups, those confounding variables will Balance. basically cancel each other yeah, out. And then the only effective difference between the group is our actual intervention. So that's called a experimental design, and the best experimental design is what we call randomised control trial that's blinded. Yep. So blinded means that um, the researchers and some occasionally the participants won't know which intervention they actually got. Mm. So you can do that with, a, say, a, a vitamin supplement because you can give people a, an inert tablet and somebody gets a real one, and that's the absolute gold standard. Yep. And then we can take the level of evidence another step further. With something called a meta-analysis. And a meta-analysis basically says, look, you might just by chance, if you do enough of these randomised control trials, it's just like flipping a coin, you might get 10 heads in a row just by chance Got it. Um, through probability. So a meta-analysis says, well, why don't we take all of the randomised control trials together and, and analyse them as one and see what the average result is because we know that the more numbers there is, statistically, mm. the more likely it is to represent a true finding. Got it. So I tend to place more weight in experimental designs yep. and meta-analyses. Now, one of the problems with some of the meta-analyses is because we don't have a lot of experimental studies backing it up, they, uh, they might do a meta-analysis on research that's been poorly done. And uh, as you know, garbage in, garbage out. So you have to be careful when you do look at the meta-analysis of the, mm. uh, the type of studies which they were looking at. Got it. Can I come back to the plant-based vegan diet? Is it possible to get all the nutrients you need for optimal health for the average punter? No. 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 What are the big things that you miss by being on a vegan diet? Well, the, the one that everybody knows about is vitamin B12. Um, Which you can't get unless you're having animal you protein. You cannot get unless you're having animal foods. Now, there's some people that talk about bacterial production way down in the colon and all of this, and that's basically garbage. Even if there were um, bacteria down inside your colon that could be producing B12, that's not where it's absorbed in the intestines. Mm. So you, you're basically going to excrete it. So um, you cannot have, by definition, a nutritionally complete vegan diet 
without supplementation. Now, vegetarian diet... Supplementation in the form of oral or intravenous supplements? Well, or? it's well. Let's it's either got to be yeah, oral B12 or injectable B12. Now, on a vegetarian diet, because you are permitted some animal foods, then you do get higher amount. You can get some of these, but the vegan diet is absolutely impossible to be optimally healthy without extraneous supplementation. Then we come to other nutrients, which we know. Um, things like zinc and iron and copper, um, which are far higher concentration in animal foods than they are in plant foods. And it's not just the concentration of these nutrients that we need to be aware of, but also their form. For instance, the ver the type of iron, so you've got heme and non-heme iron, the type of iron that you get in plant foods is very difficult for the body to absorb and to know what to do with mm. compared to the iron that we have in meat. Um, and that goes for, you know, as I alluded to before with the omega-3s, the type of omega-3 that we get from plants is very hard for the body to know what to do with, whereas uh, what we call the marine omega-3, basically to reflect that it's a, a good quality DHA, um, the body's very easily able to assimilate that into its tissues. Then we also have a factor called anti-nutrients. And this sounds a little bit sci-fi. Anti-nutrients. But we've all heard about it. So... There's a reason your doctor tells you not to drink tea when you have an iron supplement. If you're, if you're a vegetarian low in iron, the reason is because there's substances in the tea, like tannins and phytates, that will actually interfere with the absorption of the nutrients. Mm. So, for instance, we've done some studies looking at zinc absorption. And if you combine, if you have a uh, zinc-rich food, like oysters, and have some black beans at the same time, you will reduce your absorption of that zinc by more than 50%. So in effect, you're getting less than half of what you otherwise would have if you didn't have that food with the uh, beans at the same time because of these anti-nutrient factors within the beans. Um. So it it's becomes very, very difficult. So we, we all get hooked up on these recommended daily intakes and things like that. And really, they've been created with very poor science um, and it doesn't necessarily reflect whether or not the micronutrient you're looking at is the most bioavailable form. And it certainly doesn't take into account what you're consuming it with that concurrent consumption of these anti-nutrient substances mm. will then impair the uh, end nutrient result that you're getting from that. And that's not even including the deleterious effect that certain substances in plants, such as lectins or glutens, these other type of proteins, that they actually are known to cause harm to us, to humans. So uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts. There is, but it it's, and I don't think there's ever been a point in time in in the history of man where more people are convinced that the best thing for their own health and the health of the planet is a plant-based diet. And mm. I can only assume it's because the the plant-based movement and the climate change movement that quite often has hidden agendas and quite often has big corporations behind it have just been very good at, at spreading their, their message propaganda is probably a word I'd prefer to use, but let's call it spreading their message. How can we get the science so wrong? And 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 I do want to talk about the other side of the ledger in a minute. Um, and, and maybe we're starting to have more influences on the omnivore carnivore side of it. But in your view, why do you think that, that so many people are misguided in believing that they're doing the right thing for themselves and the planet by eating a plant-based diet? I think it's a a simple and an instinctive message. I also happen to think it's wrong. Um, th there's a couple of very appealing things. So we, we know that this whole business about the saturated fats in the diet being bad for us is just complete bunkum. But the logical extension of that, if you accept that premise, is that because plant foods are very low in saturated fats, plant foods, ergo, must be good for us. Mm. So... The, we can make these type of leaps of faith. And there, is, there are studies out there that do appear to demonstrate that the plant-based diets are good for us, understanding that they've set a very low bar of comparing themselves to junk food rich 
carbohydrate-rich, processed food-rich diets. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, basically you, you could go out and, uh, you know, have a bowl of mud. Um, that, that's going to beat the Australian diet, yeah. the average Australian diet. Then it comes this uh, this ethical issue as well. And instinctively that is appealing for a lot, of, especially a lot of young people. And I, I can understand the appeal there, but I think there's also a lack of understanding that a true vegan diet does not exist without dead animals. This is this is this is a conversation that I've had a couple of times with some really learned people around the fact that so many more animals are killed by plant-based agriculture than by animal-based agriculture, you know, and, and we used an example recently. We had Joel Salatan, that amazing sustainable farmer on the podcast a few weeks ago around a farmer here in Australia that raises animals and raises crops and has mm. done the study on how many animals die and the length and pain of their death through plant-based agriculture versus an animal that's part of the food chain and is raised and treated and has one bad nanosecond second in its life. But again, it's a conversation that gets caught up in romantic views of Disney characters and that a cow's more valuable than a field mice or a bird or whatever it happens to be. Well, let's look at it like this. So we know that plants come from soil and they, they draw all their nutrition and their sustenance from the soil in which they've grown. And yet if we don't fertilise the soil, then uh, the if you don't feed the soil, you won't grow anything. We know this. The mm. soil will be depleted. Now... When after World War II, when we had this boon in agriculture, this discovery of fossil fuels and how we could use the fossil fuels to make fertilizer and we were growing. Now think for a second, fossil fuel, mm. dead animals. Yeah. We, we basically require, without death, there is no life. Yeah, I agree fully. With it, without um, biological matter that comes from things that have previously been in existence, our soil is barren. Mm. So it, in essence, um, there is no such thing as a vegan diet. Mm. Uh, and if you think there is, you are kidding yourself. Mm. And then it comes to the environmental effects. Every time you take a plough to a soil, you turn it over, you expose trillions of microbes to the elements, to the UV radiation of the sun, they get blown away. Every, every season that you plough a field, you deplete the topsoil. And it's been estimated that by 2020, we'll have depleted 50% of the topsoil that we've ever had. By next year. Uh, effectively, yes. Yeah. So, sure, we've still got a lot of topsoil to go, but what happens when that runs out? Mm. Now, so growing crops depletes this. Do you know what replenishes topsoil? Grazing ruminant animals. Yeah. Because they've got this remarkable ability. So grass from the cellulose in grass, so is basically produced uh, through this remarkable process using the sun rays. Photosynthesis. Um, photosynthesis. Yeah. And then these, uh, these cows, they can come and they can uh, basically uh, ferment that in their guts and they'll have excrement that comes out the other end mm. and that will actually build topsoil. So whereas if you crop up land, you deplete the topsoil, if you graze a land with ruminants, you'll replenish that soil. Particularly if it's rotational. And then, and people will also talk about the water use. It's almost like if a cow drinks some water that it doesn't come out the other end. Mm. It's not waste water. Mm. The cow is actually uh, watering the fields for you yeah. via the urine. So this, these whole arguments, the zero-sum game about, you know, cattle do this and they do that, they've actually been shown to lead to a sequestration of carbon. They're yeah. actually, if you actually have a look at it and how much carbon actually gets sequestered in the soil um, from grazing, the running cattle is actually beneficial from a carbon balance perspective. Yeah. So it doesn't matter which way you look at it. I mean, they're, they're very appealing vegan arguments, but they're very easily dispatched. If you have a look at from an ethical perspective, then you can understand that, you know, it, it's not, you, they're you don't have life without death and it's just yeah. you've got to be an adult, grow up and admit that there's no other way for you to thrive. It is impossible for you as a human 
to exist without there being death on some level. Yeah. Um, if you have a look at it from an environmental perspective, we've just had the wool pulled over our eyes. Mm. Um, if you have a look at it from a nutritional perspective, again, we've been misled. Yeah. So whichever way you look at it, I don't believe that a vegan diet stacks up. There's a, there's another, and this isn't meant to be a, a vegan bashing exercise because I, I, I will always see this. I, I respect people's choices to do whatever they want, but to your point about ethical decisions, that one of the big things that, that most vegetarians and vegans don't want to acknowledge is for them to live on a plant-based diet, the only way we can get, and let's use Australia as, as an example, since we're sitting here in Sydney, the only way for them to eat that plants-based diet year round is for us to import from other countries, typically third world countries that can't afford to give up that food where most of the malnourishment, the 2 billion people in the world that are, are currently living malnourished comes from and so if you want to talk about ethics then you need to expand your understanding of how this whole food chain works yeah and then importing avocados from brazil so that we can eat them for 15 dollars a pop down in bondi doesn't make you an ethically right person that that's true i you know? couldn't agree more yep i do want to talk about because for the first time in a decade, I can remember that the whole, and, and let's go to the extreme because this carnivore movement that people like Sean Baker and Jordan Peterson and, and some other well-known, um, call them influencers around the globe, you know, and, and I, I can't quite understand how anyone can just live on meat, but I don't want to pass judgment on that. It just doesn't seem intuitively right to me. But what are what are the true what are, what is the truth about red meat? And you spoke about some of the incredible deficiencies from having a plant based diet. So I can only assume that the 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 flip side of that is that you're getting that from from eating um, ethically grazed and harvested, predominantly plant fed um, beef and 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 other more animal produce. Yeah. What are some of the, the, the real truths about red meat in particular that, that we should talk about? Well, I think one of the myths is that red meat can be nutritionally deficient. Um, the first one that most dietitians I speak to will say, what about vitamin C? Um, it's because, full of vitamin C, isn't it? Well, that's a very interesting thing. So in the, the classical teaching is that there is no vitamin C in meat. Or carbohydrate for that and matter. Yet, but if you actually have a look at some of the food tables, and this was elegantly pointed out by Amber O'Hearn, when you... Who's Amber O'Hearn? Amber O'Hearn, she's one of the prominent uh, carnivores. Um, she arranged Carnivoricon in uh, Boulder and Colorado yeah. earlier this year. Um, she's a, a very, uh, very astute and bright lady. Now, she went and had a look at some of these food tables that listed uh, vitamin C content of meat as being zero, and they just had a little little number, it might have been six or seven, they said beside it in um, subscript. And she went down and had a look at that and it said assumed zero. Mm. They didn't even calculate it. They just, they were so confident in their own opinion that there was no vitamin C in meat. They'll just put it in the table, in the, put it in the medical literature for posterity. And yet we know there is vitamin C in meat. Mm. So in the Napoleonic Wars, um, when they used to have scurvy, they used to use the raw horse meat from uh, the horses that were killed in battle to cure scurvy. It's been long known uh, historically, and this has been known for most 200 years, that meat has been described as an antiscorbotic. It's basically an agent that will cure scurvy. So there is absolutely no truth to the, uh, to the statement that there's not sufficient uh, vitamin C in, in meat. In meat. Now, some people will point out and say, well, the quantities in, uh, in meat is so far below what the RDI is. Well, the recommended daily intake is based on a, a carbohydrate-intensive diet. So glucose actually competes with vitamin C for uptake. So if you're not putting all this sugar into your body, then you actually will absorb a higher fraction. Mm. And there's also uh, vitamin C is also used to produce something called carnitine, which is uh, a molecule involved in fat metabolism. Now, the C-A-R-N, the first four letters, now this is the Latin root for flesh. Mm. So carnitine is only found in meat. 
And if you don't eat meat, then you're not ingesting this. You have a much greater need for vitamin C to help your body synthesize this. But if you are eating lots of meat, then that actually will have a vitamin C sparing effect. You're not using your vitamin C as much for this purpose. So there's several mechanisms by which on a uh, on a low carbohydrate diet that includes meat, your vitamin C needs will actually be much less and almost certainly the uh, vitamin C content in your diet will be sufficient for your needs. Mm. What are some of the other big ones that are, are found in, and let's continue with just red meat because, again, it, it is the most nutritionally dense, but what are the big things that you're getting from red meat? Well, the big one, iron, is an obvious one. It so. is an obvious one that everyone knows, yeah. Um, D? Well, yeah, you can get a little bit of vitamin D. Interestingly, I believe there's a difference between whether it's uh, been raised in a feedlot or not. Um, so I think it was in about 1970 when they discovered um, vitamin D as a nutrient, and that was actually what then allowed them to start doing the feedlots because they could then start injecting the cattle with it because they weren't necessarily getting it from their environment in the same way. Because the feedlots were not in the sunshine? Or? Look, I'm not sure if it's a sunshine thing or if it's a uh, from the, the from grain. the from the grass. But yeah. I do know that historically, feedlot without um, giving them vitamin D, it's a uh, oh, cattle in feedlots do need vitamin, vitamin D. Yeah, now, okay. one of the other interesting uh, extensions on that is there's another vitamin called vitamin K2, mm -hmm. which is essential for metabolic health. It actually helps us, uh, it reduces calcification in our blood vessels. It actually helps us put calcium into our bones. It improves our bone mineral density. And my understanding is that on grass-fed and pasture-raised cattle, there's a very nice level of vitamin K2, um, but it's uh, likely to be much lower in... Uh, and feedlot raised cattle. Yeah, get it. Um, do you honestly think that you can live in optimal health on a pure carnivore diet? Look, I have it to say... It is extreme. I get I've, it's extreme, but there, there seems to be people that are doing it and yeah. and it's just anecdotal evidence, but that, that seem to look... And what's the guy's name that... Um, Aaron McKenzie. I was mm. watching some of his things. Is he a carnivore? Uh, from what I understand, yes. The guy is freakishly talented, healthy, agile. Um, is that just because he's got good genetics or mm. is part of that that... I have to say I haven't seen any research that would tell me, that would convince me it's not possible to be extremely healthy on carnivore. I do know several people personally who are carnivores who appear to be in very, very good health. Were they not in good health before when they were on a sad diet? Yes. Yeah. Yes, and I've actually got several patients who are carnivores and who have actually reversed chronic health issues by going carnivore. Um, and, I mean, some people will say the jury is out because we haven't got long-term studies on them. We do have population evidence. We, we look at the Maasai and the Inuit and other uh, historical cultures which were often... Are predominantly uh, animal products, mm. very, very little uh, foraging. And uh, so the historical data would certainly suggest that it's possible to be very, very healthy yep. on an animal-based diet with minimal, if any, plant food. Interesting. I want to talk about some of the, again, the things that most people have heard over the years, red meats, bad for cholesterol, heart disease, etc. Cholesterol is a big one and I had... Uh, personal experience recently with a doctor that I, I respect. I've been to her. She's a GP. She's she's a lovely human being. And, you know, as far as GPs go, she seems to be reasonably knowledgeable. But we had this conversation recently about my cholesterol is too high. And I said, explain more to me what you're testing, you know, because I've got enough knowledge to be dangerous, you know, and I was trying not to be insulting because I really like this woman and, and as I say, she's a terrific doctor. She said, your LDL bad cholesterol is bad. And I'd been to see you four years ago. So again, I knew enough to be dangerous. I said, but what about the substrands? And it wasn't even, it was probably not even the right terminology. 
can you and she didn't have an answer for it so again no disrespect but i walked out of there saying you know what i need to talk to someone that's done a little bit more up-to-date research on that let's talk about cholesterol in terms of cholesterol in general but also the correlation between meat consumption and cholesterol well, I mean, cholesterol is a molecule that's essential for life. So first of all, if you actually ask the average doctor what cholesterol is, they will not be able to tell you. In medical school, I got through a whole medical degree and I did pretty well. I got on it. Mm. And I honestly could not have told you what cholesterol was at the end of it. I could tell you all of I could use a nomenclature. I could say HDL, LDL ratios, APOA1, APOB, etc. I could do I could talk the talk. Mm. But I honestly didn't have a good conceptual understanding of what it was. So let's talk about what is cholesterol. It's a small molecule. It is essential for life. Every cell has it. It's so important that if you don't eat it, the body will make it. If you do not have any cholesterol, you will die. So that's what cholesterol is. Now, what doctors call cholesterol are very complex particles. Think of them like a submarine that circles around inside your blood mm. and they carry cholesterol inside. Now, if you've ever um, poured some water inside a frying pan that's got a bit of fat in it, you'll see how the fat forms globules. Yeah. So fat that's what fat does and fat, can't move around the circulation as a globule. It's got to be broken up into smaller particles. So this is why we need these particles, and we call them lipoproteins, yeah. which will actually carry the cholesterol around the body. Now, the one that we talk about as being dangerous um, is called an LDL, a low-density lipoprotein. Now, for some reason, and I, well, I'll tell you why, we associate high levels of LDL with heart disease. And this comes back to a guy called Ansel Keys, mm. and he developed what he called the lipid heart hypothesis. And he postulated that higher levels of saturated fat um, in the body could actually uh, then lead to deposition inside the arteries. And his model was developed from rabbits, an herbivore, an animal which has absolutely no capacity for, uh, you know, protein and uh, fats in their diet. So what did they feed these rabbits? <laughs> well, saturated fat, and they fed them saturated fat, and somehow they thought that you could uh, translate an herbivore's experience and physiology to a human. human. So yeah, it's yeah. basically utter, utterly bad science. Yeah. But if you subscribe to this theory that saturated fat is then bad, we also have made the observation that saturated fat can increase the amount of circulating LDL. So if you accept the premise saturated fat is bad, then you must also accept the premise that LDL, high levels of LDL, is also bad. Mm. Now, unfortunately, the very first premise was wrong, so the second premise is also wrong. And the most recent meta-analysis um, that looked at 19 separate studies looking at all-cause mortality, so your chance of dying mm. and um, your LDL levels, they actually found in 16 of them that there was an inverse relationship. That is, the higher your LDL level, the longer you lived. Okay. So I mean, if, if that Bingo. doesn't, I live if, a long time. If that doesn't immediately make you suspicious of our uh, of our fear of LDL, then I don't know what will. But we still do know that LDL does end up lining the blood vessels, and I'll tell you what happens there. It's when LDL gets damaged, and it can be damaged in two ways. It can be damaged through a process called glycation where sugar attaches to it. Mm -hmm. And it can be damaged through a process called oxidation, which is to do with uh, uh, electrons in valent. It, it's basically, uh, think of it like rusting of a molecule. It's yeah. a, bit of a, a, a bit of a loose description. But it can be oxidized or it can be glycated or damaged mm -hmm. by sugar. So what does that mean? So... If these things lead to LDL clogging your blood vessels, that means high blood sugar is bad and high oxidative stress is bad. What gives you high high blood glucose? Well, carbohydrates are made of glucose. So therefore, eating high carbohydrate diets is what actually will turn your LDL bad. And oxidative stress, number of contributing factors in our modern lifestyles, but a big one is the omega-6 fats, vegetable and seed oils. So simply put, 
If you want to make sure that your LDL population remains healthy and is going to make sure that you're in uh, that population who lives longer with a high LDL, mm. don't have excessive amounts of vegetable and seed oils yeah. and don't have excessive amounts of carbohydrate. Yeah. That will keep you having a healthy cholesterol. Yeah, interesting. I think this for a lot of people is exciting, liberating, perhaps a little bit agitating. What tests should people be doing? Because, again, this is one of my fundamental – that's the reason why I just don't go to the doctor anymore. I just went this year because my dad's a doctor and he said, you got to get a check up, you're 50. And I said, Dad, you're a stubborn old prick. I'll just go and get it. <laughs> but you go in and you get cholesterol done and we've just, we won't go back down that rabbit hole. Mm. Well, we can. Well, let, let's talk about if you're worried about your cholesterol yeah. Um, and if you want to know, do you have this damaged LDL? So we actually call that small dense because yeah. when it gets okay. glycated and oxidised, it actually gets a fraction smaller. Yeah. And um, we can do a fancy test to measure that. Um, that costs $120. It has to be sent to uh, one of the research laboratories. However, we can get a, a proxy of that looking at something called your HDL and your triglyceride ratio. Now, triglycerides are actually produced in the liver predominantly when you have excessive carbohydrate. Mm. So triglyceride is a very good marker of excess carbohydrate, and we know that it's excess carbohydrate that damages your LDL. And the data shows that if we have a look at the ratio between your triglyceride and your HDL, that will be a far better predictor of your chance of dropping off the perch than we're looking at your LDL level. Mm. So triglyceride to HDL ratio would be something very good. There's another test called the HbA1c, and this is a test. So if you visualise that inside your blood vessels, you've got the pipe, you've got your blood cells, they're sort of like a, a UFO, or like a donut shaped yep. floating around, and you've also got molecules of sugar going around. So remember the term blood glucose level. Mm -hmm. So there is sugar in the blood. Now, these glucose molecules can passively attach to the blood, blood cells. Now, this, uh, this just happens based on the concentration of the sugar and how long it's been in contact. So if we understand that the average lifespan of a red blood cell is 120-odd days, then we can actually take a red blood cell, have a look at how much sugar is attached to it, and that can give us a rough guide for what your average blood sugar level is. So, And this average blood sugar is a very good indicator of your risk of heart disease, far better than almost any other blood test we can do. Mm. And why is it such a good indicator? Why does it have such strong predictive value? Because the problem causing a lot of this is high levels of carbohydrates. So HbA1c is certainly a good one. And there's a bunch of other inflammatory markers, but if I had to pick two, mm. if you're worried about heart disease, simple blood tests that are very easily available, Go Tri do it. triglyceride, HDL, and HbA1c. What are some of the others, though, Paul? Because assume that the, there are a bunch of people that are listening to this that really do want to be able to, to measure their improvement. If I'm going to go down this path of, of having better health, then let's measure it. What are some of the other tests they should be doing and, and can they get them done at their GP or do they need to come to a, a specialist like you to, to really understand what's going on under the hood? Look, most GPs will do these as standard. The question is, do they truly understand what the results mean? Well, that's a and no. I think that's a given. For, for, for uh, No disrespect, for the vast majority of GPs, they don't understand it. I, I think one of the problems is that when the blood tests come out, down the right-hand side of the page we have a what's called a reference range. Mm. And basically that is a 95% confidence interval in most cases where 95% of the population will be expected to fall within that result. And the result is only flagged as being abnormal if it falls outside that level. Now, here's the problem. Do you think 95% of the population is healthy? Of course not. These, these values do not reflect optimal health. They don't even reflect, you know, mediocre health a lot of the time. They just reflect a statistical marker. Mm. So, and a lot of doctors are interpreting the blood results based on these reference ranges. So that's where the first problem is. Let's take, for example, a marker of liver damage. So imagine that you've got a liver cell. It's like a, a ball. Mm -hmm. And you've got certain chemicals inside that, enzymes, that are not really found in high concentration in other tissues. Now, if that liver cell gets sick and bursts open, that will release its content into the plasma. We can do a blood test and we can detect it. So one of these markers is called ALT. 
Um, that's the abbreviation we often use, and it, it's well known as a liver enzyme. Mm-hmm. And if that level is particularly high, that suggests liver damage. And this whole pathology of metabolic disease is central to the liver. So this is another very good marker of metabolic health. So what happened over the last 30 years as a population got healthier? Well, this reference range, it used to have an upper limit of about 20. And it used to, when everybody was skinny and healthy, and if you were over 20, you would say, Ooh. How long ago was that? Like oh, the, 50 years? Uh, probably 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, and over time, that has just gradually increased. So now for females, most females, the upper limit is set at 30. And for some labs, the upper limit for males is set at 40. So you can be simply because the population has gotten less healthy, rather than say, well, diagnose every second person with fatty liver, Mm. we just move the goalposts. So I guess to uh, go back to your original point about what blood tests to do, so these liver enzymes are very good to assess metabolic health, but you have to understand the context in which they're interpreted. Do not interpret them in the context of the population, interpret them in the context of what is optimal health. Optimal health, yeah, it's a good one. Anything else they should be testing? Inflammatory markers. I mean, I homocysteine. I, look, I do a uh, a large number of blood tests depending on what I find uh, when I examine the patient and take a history. So, um, I, I guess I've probably talked about the main ones, but there is a, a whole lot of uh, secondary ones, and homocysteine is certainly one. Homocysteine reflects malabsorption state. So if you're not absorbing nutrients effectively, this could be B2, B6, B12, folate, um, your homocysteine level will rise. Now, for most reference ranges, it's uh, considered normal um, if it's under 12 or some reference ranges even under 15. Mm. But the data very clearly shows your risk of dying goes up when it's over 9. So I actually use elevated homocysteine as a marker of uh, malabsorption, which is often uh, secondary to intestinal inflammation. So if I go back a step, when you ingest a nutrient, it goes into your mouth and ends up going through your stomach and into your intestines. There it's broken down Mm. into small parts and then it will cross the wall of the intestine where it can be absorbed into the body. Now, if you have inflammation or dysfunction in the intestinal wall, then perhaps you're not going to be able to absorb all of these, uh, these nutrients. And this is very interesting. I mentioned before, very early on in our chat about lectins and gluten. Yeah. This is where some of these proteins, which are found in plant-based foods, they can actually cause intestinal inflammation. So if I see somebody with an elevated homocysteine that's outside of optimal, I'll then often go and do some testing for something called antibodies, which is an autoimmune disease. Now, an autoimmune disease, I know we're going into the weeds a little bit here. The weeds are good, man. Um, An autoimmune disease is when your body starts attacking itself. So if you get an infection, um, let's say, uh, you know, you go outside and little kid sneezes in your face, which is usually what happens when I go home. (laughs) Um, Your body will see this virus and it will say, you're not part of me, you're foreign, and it will mount what's called an immune response against it. And as a part of that immune response, you can have things called antibodies. They're like little guided missiles. Mm-hmm. And they're, pers- they're little um, personal assassins for that virus. It will go and it will attack that virus and knock it out. Now, occasionally, you can have this immune response go rogue. And rather than create antibodies that will target parasites, bacteria, viruses, they might actually target your own healthy cells. Mm. And there's very good evidence that these proteins that are predominantly found in plant foods called lectins can trigger autoimmune responses through something called molecular mimicry, which we can talk about in a moment. And then uh, once you have uh, this autoimmune response going on, um, it might attack your thyroid. So I can actually do a blood test and look for antibodies against your thyroid. It might lead to celiac disease. So there's some antibodies we look that uh, provide us evidence of celiac disease. It might be uh, affecting your pancreas and autoimmune diabetes, like uh, type 1 diabetes. It could be affecting your joints of rheumatoid arthritis. So there's a myriad of different antibodies that we can test for, and I'll usually base my selection of those antibodies based on 
somebody's symptoms. Mm. Uh, do they have joint pain? Do they have abdominal symptoms? Do they have troubles with insulin resistance, et cetera, et cetera? But I'll, I'll just backtrack now and talk about this molecular mimicry concept because yeah. it, it does sound quite foreign. So if when the immune system targets a bacteria, it doesn't actually look at the whole bacteria. It just looks at, I guess, a molecular signature, a, a, a short sequence of, uh, of amino acids or, or proteins or carbohydrates or a short sequence of molecules on the coat. And if it identifies, it, it, let's say that it might be a series of random letters, you know, A, C, E. Now, if you ingest a carbohydrate um, binding protein that has on part of it the similar, the same sequence of letters, A, C, E, and that's able to trigger an immune response because your body says, well, this is foreign, then these antibodies that are developed to target this uh, this ingested um, what we call a lectin, a carbohydrate binding protein. They can also recognise the same molecular molecular moiety on your cells. Mm. That's what we call molecular mimicry. Your immune system is just confused. And I've had a lot of success in clinic where we have people with these uh, just low grade. Um, nutrient malabsorption, they've got circulating antibodies against the thyroid. So a condition called Hashimoto's thyroiditis is very, very common. And probably if we test people um, up into their 60s and 70s, um, more than 50% of people at that age would probably have evidence of some antibodies being developed against their thyroid. And that leads to lethargy, fatigue, malabsorption of nutrients because it's also associated with gut inflammation. Mm. And when we eliminate some of these foods that have the highest concentration of these problematic lectins, their symptoms usually improve dramatically. It's a really interesting point. Um, my father-in-law, who's yeah, 60, 61, um, thin, active guy, but chronic knee problems vegetarian you know not vegan but largely vegetarian and i've been for a long time you know he's listened to duran and different things do you think that there is potential that and energy wise too i think you know just 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 struggles in general um for a guy that is ostensibly quite healthy and has a really all the other things sleeps well good family um good weight levels, all those kinds of things. Do you think that the potential that lectins or other things in plants and the absence of of some of the critical proteins and things in, in animals could, could really help him? So, yeah, there's probably three main mechanisms which, uh, which come up with regards to connective tissue health with diet. So I just want to talk quickly about uh, bone health and protein for a moment. So I don't know if you know much about osteoporosis, but conventional teaching is that when you have weak bones, reduced density, there's nothing we can do about it. We can slow the decline, but we can't actually um, reverse it. Mm. So bone is made up predominantly of two things, calcium, and one thing that people don't realise is protein. So basically bone is mineralized tendon or, you know, it's, it, it's mineralized protein. Mm. So if the body needs calcium, the calcium is stored in the bone. So the body will actually break down some of this protein matrix to get at the calcium and release it. So if you give somebody lots of calcium and lots of vitamin D, you actually reduce their need to break down more bone. And this is what the studies very clearly show. They show that when we supplement with calcium and vitamin D, we can slow down the decline in osteoporosis. Now, there was one very clever randomized control trial where at the end of it, they said, oh, we collected all this dietary data as well. Why don't we analyze the results based on protein intake? And this study was done in postmenopausal females and males over the age of 65. So the population that is considered that it's the most difficult population to deal with osteoporosis, yeah. you can't really even help it with medication. And they found that over three years, using DEXA scanning, which is a gold standard for diagnosing bone mineral density, yeah. they were able to reverse the loss of bone mineral density in the group that was having the highest amount of animal protein. So protein and connective tissue health is an absolute no-brainer. 
Now, and this is well in excess of the recommended daily intake. Yeah. So the recommended daily intake of protein was calculated in college-aged males only thinking about the structural need for protein. Basically, they were thinking, well, protein is used to build build, stru- build stuff, mm. so we'll calculate how much stuff you're building and that will be how much protein you need. But protein also does other things. It's also involved in enzymatic processes and enzymes and things like that. So all, already you can see that uh, you've, you've missed out on one of the big dietary needs for protein. So probably... Um, for optimal health, you need to double that recommended daily intake for protein. Now, just to go back to your question about more specifically about knee pain Mm. and if there's uh, the dietary components of that. So going back to lectins, so we know that some people and certainly people with rheumatoid arthritis, there's studies when they cut wheat out of their diet, they get better. So one of these lectins that is problematic is called wheat germ agglutinin. And that can actually bind to something called glucosamine. So glucose, the sugar thing. Mm. So these lectins are carbohydrate binding proteins. So they bind to carbohydrates. And remember, sugar is a carbohydrate. So glucosamine can actually bind to the wheat germ agglutinin. Now, if you take glucosamine at the same time that you're eating wheat, it can bind in your intestine, the, the hollow of your intestine, what we call the intestinal lumen, before it gets absorbed into your system. And this explains why there's so many people around the world that swear that glucosamine helps their joint pain. And yet when we study it, we don't see any benefit. And the reason we don't see any benefit is that the people who are getting benefit from glucosamine have an inflammatory joint pain. And the people who we study, by definition, we say, oh, it must help osteoarthritis. We require you to have osteoarthritis that's proven on a knee X-ray. Um, so basically, we exclude the people with inflammatory pain for our study, and we only have the people with arthritis. Mm. And then we wonder why there's no clear evidence that it works. And yet, every orthopedic doctor, every surgeon, every sports doctor you ever speak to will tell you that they've got dozens and dozens of patients who swear that the glucosamine helps their system symptoms. And that's the mechanism that the glucosamine helps. It actually binds to this lectin, the wheat germ agglutinin, and stops it from having an inflammatory effect. So if you're, uh, uh, you know, have a relative on a vegetarian or a, a vegan style diet with lots of wheat um, who's having inflammatory knee pain, you could do worse than giving a trial of glucosamine. The other, as a supplement or through? As a supplement. Yeah. You just get it from a health food store. Um, that uh, obviously uh, that's what not... What about that's, bioavailability and things like that? Because it just, it, it seems like it's... You don't need to absorb it. The whole point is that it binds to... Okay. It, it, it binds, it, it doesn't matter what happens inside your body. Yeah. It's not being incorporated into the cartilage or anything like that that we used to think. All it does is it binds to this other deleterious molecule before that can be absorbed. Get it. Now, um, the other thing is that you can, uh, fatty liver will actually lead to weaker connective tissue. So all our connective tissue in the body, it's, uh, imagine you've got a cell and each cell is responsible for what we call an extracellular matrix. It's basically a sphere of scaffolding Mm -hmm. around it. Bone is like this, um, tendons, ligaments, every tissue we have, it's basically a nucleus in a cell and then you have this zone of connective tissue. Now, this connective tissue or extracellular matrix is constantly remodeling, breaking down a little bit, reforming a little bit. Now, there's some circulating enzymes called matrix metalloproteinases, and they are the only enzyme in the body that can actually break this extracellular matrix down. So if you have higher levels of these circulating matrix metalloproteinases, you're basically leading to a, a, a softening or a weakening of the connective tissue. And they're produced from the liver. And when you get a fatty liver, they're produced in much, much higher concentrations. And this is why, especially when we see uh, pain from arthritis where the cartilage is already thinned out. Mm. So if you've lost a lot of your cartilage, you want the cartilage that's left to be as strong and resilient as possible. So you really want to have a low amount of these matrix metalloproteinases. And fortunately, when you lose just a small amount of body weight, it usually comes from the liver first. It usually corrects fatty liver 
quite early on in the piece, and then your liver stops secreting the same volume of these matrix metalloproteinases. And then that means that this uh, you don't have this softening effect on your, your connective tissues anymore. Mm. And that's why a very moderate reduction in body weight. So somebody might lose on average 10% of their body weight and the data shows that their pain will reduce by 30 to 50%. Yeah, wow. And this is- 10% is a lot though. Well, 10% is well, a lot. I suppose depending how heavy you are. But like if, if you lost 10% of your weight, you'd be- well, I'm I'm about eighty kilos. Yeah, so ten so, percent is uh, takes you down to low seventies. Yeah, I mean, but that that's a reason why, and we're talking about people who are obese. But if you have somebody who's one hundred and fifty kilograms, yeah, losing fifteen's not, and they go down it. to one hundred and thirty five kilograms, makes a there's, quantum difference. They're still very very overweight. Yeah, so clearly, it's the benefit on their knee pain is not mechanical predominantly. It's these inflammatory effects and these uh, systemic effects of these matrix metalloproteinases. And it's just, a, for me, it's fascinating how you could, you know, get such a dramatic reduction. And we didn't understand it for a long time. Mm. And it was only when we were able to, when we figured out the pieces that the uh, liver makes this enzyme and the liver is the first thing that actually loses fat when you lose weight. So this is why if you lose 10% of your body weight, you still might be technically obese, but you can be metabolic health metabolically healthy in the same way that we also have the uh, the other flip of the coin, what we call TOFI, which is thin on the outside and fat on the inside. Yeah. So you see, you go down to a park run on the weekend and how many of these guys are exercising a lot and they've all got that pot belly? Mm, you know, these, mid- these middle-aged guys with that little pot belly, they're yeah. exercising, they're trying to do everything they can. I promise you they've got they've got fat in the wrong place. Yeah around their liver yeah how important is fasting from an optimal health perspective or is it a little bit uh of a fad that 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 seems to be getting as much airplay as the plant-based movement i think fasting is very helpful if you're metabolically unhealthy so if you have this if if you're having a an unhealthy diet if you're eating crap food you'll get health benefits by eating that in a time-restricted fashion. By giving your, basically uh, giving your body a little bit of a fast and giving your body a break from sustained elevation of insulin levels and um, these circulating fatty acids that are produced after a carbohydrate-rich meal. And there's very good evidence that, you know, that time-restricted eating, which is, you know, maybe eating in uh, a six-hour window or intermittent fasting, that, that... they're very similar conceptually, but there are some differences between yeah. them. Either and or will lead to metabolic improvements for the exact same macronutrient intake. Um, but so if, you change nothing, you just eat it in a shorter window. Exactly, exactly. For both metabolically healthy and unhealthy or but particularly for metabolically unhealthy? I think it's – I don't fast. At all? Uh, well, I, I, well, I probably – I eat usually one to two meals a day. I don't consciously fast. So what times do you eat then? Whenever I'm hungry. Yeah. Um, so you're not necessarily having this 14 to 16 hour window a no, day. No, no. I, I don't believe, I, I'm a bit of a hedonist. Yeah. If I'm hungry, I'd like to eat. Sure. Um, so. I, what about your mate Deron Scher that, that, that loves this stuff? Well, he's uh, just recently done a three day fast. Yeah, we all partook. You know, some of my guys almost jumped off the bridge. <laughs> One guy said I almost lost my wife and my, <laughs> and my job. <laughs> I became so fucking cranky. And if you try and do something like that and you're not fat adapted, so what happens he when- He definitely wasn't fat adapted. When you start yeah, a ketogenic diet, you it takes a while for the cellular machinery for your body to start breaking this fat down. You basically will starve your it's brain dying. of any fuel source. So you can't. That's a really interesting thing I hadn't thought of. So he literally, because he probably wasn't efficient to use his ketones, his brain was starving so he was both not able to think and was yeah super it's, angry. So angry. He was angry, man. He was hysterical. So, I mean, for me, I think if people aren't prepared to go on a Uh, a very low-carb diet or an optimally healthy diet, then intermittent fasting is a way to make their diet healthier without changing much else. If you're on a particularly healthy diet, and I think I'm on a healthy diet, then 
I, uh, for me personally, I, I'm, I'm yet to be convinced of all these benefits of mitochondrial biogenesis and yeah, autophagy, autophagy and all yeah. of this. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong, but uh, I haven't been swayed by it myself yet. Yeah. There's definitely some psychological benefits, I think, to just learning to be a little bit uncomfortable. It's my own personal view that we've got a society that they get a cold and they take a pill, they get a sore knee, they take an anti-inflammatory, they don't like their job for a day, they change their job, that learning to be uncomfortable is a psychologically healthy thing as a society. Well, I think there's probably a lot there that uh, we could introduce into the schools. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me, you do spend a lot of time with some professional athletes, some Olympic athletes and things. Mm. They uh, Have you got a protocol or do you really adopt this N equals one approach to, to optimal nutrition? Look, it depends on the sport they're doing. I mean, it's all very logical. So Let's take the rowers, the Australian rowing team that you've been working with. Probably can't talk specifically about the rowers, no? okay, I'm afraid. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Confidential. We want them to win at the Olympics. Let's um, talk more broadly then. Uh, but, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm more on the rowing team for my medical um, diagnosis. Oh, rather, rather than, than nutrition. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, um, but look, if you pick a, um, is it an explosive event athlete or is it a, an endurance athlete? Actually, I can probably talk about one guy because I believe he's gone on public record on Twitter and a few other things as uh, mentioning himself as a patient and that's uh, Pete Jacob. Mm -hmm. um, so he won uh, the Hawaiian Ironman back in 2012. Yeah, wow. Um, so he's no slouch. Um, the most grueling event on the planet, arguably, yeah. yeah. So he's currently on a, uh, a very uh, low plant food diet at the moment and he's actually just uh, he's winding up to compete next year. And at Hawaii he, again. At Hawaii, yeah. yeah. So he's uh, basically uh, thought he'll have another crack at it. So he had his own personal reasons for uh, going to a, a heavy animal-based diet and it's certainly working for him mm. and where he's at with his training um, he he's certainly done a lot of experimentation with, uh, you know, do you have fatty meat, do you not have fatty meat, et cetera, et cetera. He had a very interesting experience recently, actually, this is a, a little bit tangential, um, where he had a, a lot of uh, aged foods and aged meats. And that this is a bit of a cultural thing we like to, especially in Australia. We might have to sponsor his um, Hawaiian Iron Man campaign. I would think he would absolutely... Reach out to him. I will. I'll, I'll put you in contact with him. We're the aged meat specialist, man. Like, <laughs> well, but, but, unfortunately, the aged meat caused him a bit of a problem. Oh, really? What happened? Well, when you That's age meat, start. when you age, re reassess this sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> when you age meat, um, there's bacteria naturally in the environment of that we can metabolize an amino acid um, called histidine mm -hmm. and produce. Uh, what's called a biogenic amine called histamine. Now, this is just a fancy way of saying biogenic just means it acts on the body yeah. and amine is just referring to its chemical st molecular structure. And that can actually cause symptoms in some people who are very sensitive, um, usually a, a, perhaps a little bit of diarrhoea or a bit of nausea. Um, so histamines are released when the body has an allergic response. So some of the uh, symptoms that people who are intolerant of meat, and there are a couple of people out there that don't go so well with meat, it's uh, quite possibly because they're having meat that's been too aged. And if they have uh, meat that hasn't been aged and it, it's sort of uh, frozen mm. um, soon after harvest, as you would, um, then the freezing can stop the histamine formation. And mo I've not met anybody who's had an intolerance to the so-called fresher meat. Um, but that's certainly very interesting. I um, I get my meats um, from a, a family farm, actually. Yeah. And they actually, um, they don't hang my meat at all. Interesting. Um, which is, I know. All plant-based? Sorry, uh, all, all plant-fed, grass-fed? Oh, yeah. So yeah. Th it's actually Bandera Farms. Yeah. Um, so they, they 
total pasture. They don't grain feed. They refuse to use uh, weed killers. They go out there picking all their weeds by hand. Amazing. Um, when they, yeah, we've got some farmers like that that we use. They're incredible. When it comes to uh, slaughter, um, they actually, uh, I mean, they really care about their animals. They, they go, they, they take do. they take the animal to the abattoir. They, they make sure it's not standing in the yard for long. It's basically straight, straight in mm. for slaughter. Um, they do everything they can. I mean, I'll tell you a funny story. They, um, <laughs> this is how crazy they are. Um, they got some horse coats and they wondered what would happen. I mean, they got a herd of, you know, 100 Angus or something like this and they bought horse blankets because they thought, oh, my, I wonder if they'll work for the cattle as well and we'll try and do that. Keep so they spent one season putting in every, everybody, all the other farmers thought they were absolutely bonkers <laughs> and they were putting these horse blankets all over their cattle. Wow, well, maybe it was. Maybe it helps them fatten up. It was well, like... they actually did find that. So, yeah. I mean, um, so the lady's name is uh, uh, Linda O'Neill and uh, so they've recently uh, rebranded, I don't know, they used to be Kersey cattle or something and mm. now they're Bundera meats, but... Um, yeah, they actually found that they actually put on more weight when they had the blankets on. That's incredible. You should is, introduce her to, and I don't know them off the top of my head, but we have this amazing association with a an on-farm processing site that, again, trying to eliminate the stress that the animal undergoes from transport from farm to mm. to the slaughterhouse and, and they're having some incredible results and so far as um, how much cortisol and things are in the body when they're slaughtered. So that that, that service is now available in, in parts of Australia and, and for some, particularly these these boutique ethical farmers, it's a really good option for them. So you should you should connect those two. And I think this is a probably a really important conversation to be having too when we're talking about the ethics of certain diets mm. is that just because you eat meat doesn't mean that you don't care about the welfare of the animal. It doesn't mean. So I, I honestly believe that sustainably raised ruminant meat is can be ethical and is more ethical than any other diet. Mm. And I guess this is my personal Great. reason why I, I source my meat and I, I eat a lot of meat. Mm. Um, and I'm very comfortable with the decision to do that because I know how my meat is raised. Yeah. I know where it's from. I know the quality of it. And, and you're prepared to pay for it. And, yeah, I mean, look, I'll be, I've got a 350-litre deep freeze. Mm. So I actually uh, I get half a cow a time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. So not everybody is, is that dedicated. Yeah, but you are eating a lot. The influences in this industry, like I, th I think there are a lot of people that are craving more information about this stuff and, and no doubt will be incredibly appreciative of what you've shared today. How do they find you? How do they follow you? Like Low Carb, Di Low Carb Doctors is your website? Yes, lowcarbdoctors.com.au. .au, which is a great resource. I've looked at that. What about on Instagram? I've, I'm on Instagram. I just haven't posted anything. Really? Actually, not, not one post? I don't. No, not one post yet. I did. Created an account Mason, though. What the fuck's going on, man? This is 2020. Yeah, so I've been told that Twitter is outdated and that puts me in the uh, older generation well, already. Well, Twitter's the water cooler of the the digital age, man. It's just it's just people sitting around chewing the fat. I was going to yours is a very visual education process. I was going to cross post and then I got told that just wasn't cool. Yeah. So uh, Okay, well we'll keep that but I'll, um Dr. Paul, Paul check. Dr. Paul Mason on Twitter. Yep. Okay, cool. The guys can find you there. Um, Sean Baker is another guy that I know you respect a lot. Yeah. So he's, uh, he does a podcast called the H Human Performance Outliers Podcast, HPO. Needs a little bit of audio help. We're going to help him with that. I think he's... Uh, Get there, Louie onto it. I think they just figured that out. But I mean, yeah, it was quite abominable for a while there. Yeah, But um, great but content. I great have content. Seen. Now, two other people who are in this space who are absolutely brilliant is Dr. Georgia Ede, yeah. um, E-D-E. Now, she's a, I think it was Harvard-trained um, psychiatrist and she actually treats a lot of her patients with dietary management. Um, she sort of uh, no longer just looks at uh, the human brain as a, a mix of uh, chemicals subject to manipulation with drugs. Mm. And uh, She's a psychiatrist? Psychiatrist. Yeah. And she's got some brilliant insights. And if you're looking at developmental psychology or the nutrient needs of the brain and a lot of this, she provides a really compelling argument about why a plant-based diet uh, does not lead to optimal brain health. 
Well, it was something I was going to ask you. Is there the risk that it, it is goes the other way, that depression, anxiety, et cetera, may be aggravated by, by not having enough protein in your diet? Well, it's not the protein, it's the iron. So there's a chemical in our brain called dopamine. Yeah, it, it, the happy drug. Of, yeah, the feel-good one. Yeah. The brain needs iron to make dopamine. Let that sink in for a moment. And you can't take it as a supplement because that's what people will say. I get. Well, you can't take dopamine. No, you need. No, no, you can't take iron as a supplement and have it bioavailable. Well, you can take it as a supplement, but it it it's got a lot of side effects. Most of my patients will complain of constipation when we give iron tablets, Mm. Um, and it, it doesn't get absorbed particularly well. And even if you are supplementing with lots of it, unfortunately, this intestinal inflammation, which is often triggered by gluten and these other things, will prevent you from absorbing iron or it will lead to something we call functional sequestration. Now, this is a... a uh, good word. Let me just... Uh, I, I had the dictionary out just before I came on. Of course you did. So let me just sort of elaborate on what this is. So as we've evolved... Um, over the eons, we haven't been exposed to autoimmune disease. The only thing that we've been worried about is infection. And so the predominant cause of inflammation in our bodies has only been infection. Mm. So when we've been inflamed, the response of the body is to say, hang on, there might be a bacteria around. The bacteria needs iron to proliferate. I'm going to lock my iron away so the bacteria can't use it. That will help me kill it. Yeah. And that is a very intelligent thing to do. Now, the problem is, is that while you're locking it away from the bacteria, you're locking it away from yourself. So you might have lots of iron in the body, but it's what was sequestered. It's, it, it, it's stored in a molecule called ferritin. And, you're, and when you're inflamed, your body just can't touch it. Now, if you have autoimmune inflammation, your body says, oh, we've got inflammation, we better lock our iron stores away. Mm. And this is then a a counterproductive thing to do because it means that this inflammation goes on for months and months and months. So you end up, your ferritin stores will be very, very high. The doctor will look at it and say, oh, you've got enough iron, but the trouble is you can't use it. it. It's called functional iron deficiency or latent iron deficiency. Interesting. So in that state... Um, even if you're, even if you are supplementing and trying to absorb it, if you're, if some of these plant-based foods are triggering an inflammatory response, that leads you still can't use the iron. You're going to be do- deficient in dopamine, and no amount of tablets is going to help you out. Yeah, well, Dr. Georgia Eid, who was the other one you're going to mention? Amber O'Hearn. Amber O'Hearn. She's a doctor? No, she's actually. Uh, I don't know if we can use the term citizen scientist, but she is. I believe she's uh, a trained linguist, maybe a degree in Russian and mathematics, and she's just got a very analytical mind. Yeah, interesting. And she can uh, she can look at a paper and call BS from twenty paces. Yeah. Um, and she's uh, I really appreciate some of her analysis on some of the topics such as um, vitamin C and foods and things like that. So certainly worth a look at both their work. Yep, yeah, and Gary Tubbs. Yeah, so Gary Taubes is, um, he probably broke the whole low-carb movement, you know, over 10 years ago with his book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. Um, if anybody's interested in uh, just broaching the subject for the first time, you could do worse than read his book. Um, he's certainly a, uh, he's probably one of the doyens mm. of the low-carb movement. He's probably not necessarily uh, so prolific with regards to the, the plant versus uh, animal animal debate, yeah. um, but certainly his um, he understands metabolic disease and the role of carbohydrates and insulin as well as anybody in the world. Yeah, amazing. And you've got a conference coming up, I believe. Yeah, so we've got one in uh, at Sydney University. I think it's uh, it's coming up on Thursday. The let me just uh, get this date: Thursday, the tenth of October. Um, Gary Taubes is actually going to be coming down, flying out from America to help us out there. Tickets can be at the website uh, lowcarbdownunder.com.au and uh, that's uh, if you're interested in the uh, the whole science of low-carbohydrate, that would be well worth coming out and seeing an internationally respected lecturer. Amazing. 
Paul, thanks for coming on the show, man. It's 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 endlessly interesting and, and we're going to do this a bunch more times. I think so. Look forward to it. Awesome, buddy. Thanks for having me. My pleasure, man.